Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now, the conversation you've always wanted to have about Africa. I'm Martine Dennis. Today, we're in the afterglow, as it were, of the 37th African Union Annual Summit in Addis Ababa, where leaders wrangled with conflicts, with coups, and yes, with donkeys. We start, though, with the former, in an exclusive interview with Africa Here and Now. Former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo gives us his assessment of the current crisis besetting West Africa and tells us why Western-style liberal democracy just doesn't work on the continent. With its troops fighting in the Democratic Republic of Congo and its lawyers battling Israel at the ICJ in The Hague, we ask what's driving South Africa's foreign policy 30 years after the ANC came to power in the nation's first free elections and why the polls say the party of Madiba could flop at the ballot box next time. And last but certainly not least, why in a landmark ruling, Africa's leaders have banned the slaughter of donkeys on the continent in a bid to end a growing trade in their skins for traditional Chinese medicine. Well, with me to rake over these stories are, as ever, Patrick Smith, editor of Africa Confidential. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Martine. How are things? Not too bad, not too bad. Patrick's in Johannesburg, by the way. And Donu Kogbera, journalist and political commentator in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. How are you, Donu? I'm fine, thank you. You've been bounding around the country of late and you managed to bag an exclusive with the former Nigerian president, Olusegun Obasanjo. What did you ask? What did he have to say? Well, we started off by talking about the current state of the West African regional bloc, ECOWAS, with the three military-led Sahelian governments, Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger, deciding to quit. There's need to do damage control, and I believe damage control can, can, can be done. Let, let, let me tell you uh, what a colleague of mine used to say about Nigeria's relationship with uh, Niger. Uh, and he used to say to me, look, we, we are so close that when a woman is cooking her soup in Maradi, he will send her daughter to go across the border and buy salt for the soup in Maradi. Maradi is in Niger. Harry's home. Yeah. So I believe that whatever mistakes have been made on, on all sides will be appreciated and then a new order. A new order. Mm-hmm. A new order for all countries in West Africa and indeed in Africa. Uh, we cannot have a situation where the artificial border will now be made a permanent border. Next, I asked him about Africa's partnerships in the newly emerging multipolar world, the issue of partner shopping. That is, a country looking around for agreements with several different countries, not just relying on former colonial masters. It is unfortunate, because what I believe is that we have old friends in the West, that we are free and we must be free to make new friends wherever we want to and however we want to. We will keep old friends as much as they want us to, as they want to be friendly with us. But nothing should stop us from making new friends. There's no country in the world, there's no region in the world that can go it alone. None. So I don't see anything wrong with us. Um, saying, well, uh, we are friends of the West, we are friends of China, we are friends of India, we are friends of Russia, we are friends of Europe, or we are friends of uh, uh, Japan. I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay. What I believe is wrong is some of the things that we do. Italy will say, Italy and Africa, and you have our leaders in terms rushing to uh, Italy. I believe that is to me, repulsive, repugnant rather. Repugnant, well, what are we doing? Now, Italy, we call the whole of Africa, a continent, and our leaders 
25, 35, 45, they go rushing there. And for arm, for what? Maybe for $10 billion for a, for a continent. I, I believe that, for me, I will not approve of. Then I asked him about comments he has made about the inappropriateness of Western-style liberal democracy for Africa, and he elaborated. I don't believe that Africa has now tried Western liberal democracy, and it's against our culture, our history, and everything that we have. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to look at something that is generally our own. Do you, do you have any no, case I don't study have, but I believe to create that something? Know, I don't believe that if we would start thinking. Look, in typical African, we don't, we don't have, we don't have loyal opposition. Any African language, opposition is enemy. <laughs> so yeah. where do you have loyal enemy? Yeah. And that is what you are carrying around. But the, in Europe, where it started, they had monarchy. And when they started going, you are loyal to the monarchy. So here, who are you loyal to? <laughs> loyal opposition. And take any language, any, I've looked into this, any African language, opposition is enemy. What do you do with it? And yet, we have a system where you don't have opposition. You have consensus. And you sit down under the tree or wherever, and you iron things out. And then at the end of it, everybody is a winner. And uh, Donu, how did you find Baba as he is known by many Nigerians? Because he's one of the few eminent former leaders who are tasked with carrying out so many of the diplomatic challenges that the continent now needs. And he himself has referred to, to being in what he called the departure lounge. Well, I found him reflective. I'd say a little sad. He refused to comment on anything that's happening in Nigeria, which I found significant. He was reluctant to criticize France, which, you know, and I talked about with him briefly the disconnect between how the people, the populations feel, and how the leadership of ECOWAS feels. Um, the, in Nigeria, for example, there's a lot of hooraying about the fact that the, um, the, that dashing young man in Burkina Faso has given the French a bloody nose. And, you know, the others have humbled France. So I asked Obasanjo, I asked Baba, <clears throat> what did he think about that? And he said he felt the use of the word humble was a little bit unkind, you know, a little bit hostile. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I've known him since the 1990s, and I would say that, you know, the, the, the claim that we mellow as we age applies to him. He's not as fiery as he used to be. He's really, really very, in my view, quite diplomatic now. Patrick, you're in Joburg, as we've said. So why don't we introduce Moletzi um, because it's soon to be the 30th anniversary of South Africa's first democratic elections, which brought the ANC to power. I think it was April the 27th, Patrick. Both you and I were there, weren't we? And, That's right, um, yep. 30 years they've ago. held power ever since, winning majorities in every national election. But it now looks as though the tide is turning. And Patrick, you've been in country for a bit and if the polls are to be believed, the ANC is in for a bit of a drubbing. So now, why don't you introduce our, our esteemed guest? Great. Uh, well, look, Maletsi Mbeki, thanks so much for, for joining us on the African Here and Now podcast. It's a great honour for us to have you on. Um, just want to tell the, the listeners some of the great things you've done. I mean, apart from you're your, the deputy chair of the South African Institute for International Relations, but much more importantly, you've You've written widely uh, on the political economy of Southern Africa and, and the continent at large. But let's get sort of straight into it, because you, you had a lot to say about the prospects for South Africa. And maybe we should start with this question is everyone's getting terribly excited about what's going to happen to the ANC in these elections, what's going to happen to the country indeed. Do you think that the elections, whenever they're held, and we're told now the favourite date is 22nd of May, do you think 
it's going to be a change election for South Africa or we're going to have a sort of continuation of what we've had so far? Yes, I, I think it is going to be a change election in the sense that the, the ANC's uh, hold on, on the electorate has declined enormously over the, the, the past decade or so. Uh, the, the share of the vote of the ANC has been declining and declining. And actually, they, we had a, the last election we had was in November 2021, which was a local government election, but it's, it's for the whole country. And uh, the national component of the, uh, the national tally of the local government, the ANC only got 45% of, of the vote. So the ANC has already lost the majority uh, in terms of the voting, of the voting. And as you say, the opinion polls are showing that this is what is going to happen uh, in the coming elections in a month or two. So, so does that mean then that South Africa is having to prepare itself for a first in its uh, modern history, and that's a coalition form of government? Yes, yeah, so at the, at the national level, it's very clear that the ANC, because it's not going to to get 50 plus one, will will have to partner with somebody in order to 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 form to form a a government, which is somewhat new in South Africa. Because if we take South Africa in slightly over the past hundred years, although a, a big part of of that was not democratic, South Africa has essentially been ruled by two political parties. The National Party, which were the architects of apartheid, which ruled South Africa from 1924 to, to, to 1994 with a brief uh, period uh, during the Second World War when they stepped down because they didn't want South Africa to join the war. But they soon came back in 1948. So, But now we've had continuous rule by the ANC since uh, 1994. So essentially, we've been dominated by, by single party dominance in our politics. So this will be a, a new, interesting moment. We, we've had a dress rehearsal of it, uh, especially in the big cities, in the metros. South Africa has eight metros, and the ANC used to control all of them. Uh, it got majorities in all of them. And it has gradually been losing majorities in these cities because it's losing the support of the black working class, which is concentrated in the metros, and it's losing support of the black middle class, especially the the sector of the black middle class in the private sector, which is quite sizable. So, the for example, Johannesburg today has a, a coalition government which includes the ANC and the former ANC Youth League, the breakaway, which broke away from the ANC called the Economic Freedom Fighters. They, there is a coalition of the ANC and the Freedom Fighters uh, in managing the Johannesburg City Municipality. And, and who is most likely to be the coalition partner then? Surely not the EFF, or is it likely to be the DA, the Democratic Alliance? I mean... That's a party that's still rather, well, it's seen pretty much as being the party of the whites, isn't it? Yes, that, that's how the, the, the DA is seen, although that's not an accurate picture of what the DA is. Maletsi, uh, you've written this brilliant piece in the Maverick newspaper here in South Africa. and You talk about the five deadly sins of South Africa. And I think your sin number four was um, foreign policy failures. Uh, you mentioned Mozambique. South Africa mishandling of that relationship, Zimbabwe, where you were a journalist for many years. I wonder if we can add to that what South Africa's doing in Congo right now, because it's come under a lot of fire in the South African press, the South African military intervention in Congo. I, I wonder what your thoughts were on the, those those three three countries South Africa has been involved in. Okay, let me start with Mozambique. A few years ago, London School of Economics released a report that Frelimo, the ruling party in Mozambique, 
had started a program to import heroin from South Asia to on sale to South Africa. And it listed who the people who were doing that trade with the approval of the ruling party in Mozambique. Now, this was an official report from London School of Economics, which has not been denied by, by the Mozambican government. In fact, the Americans, it turned out that some of this heroin was leaking out of South Africa to the United States, and the Americans sent their own anti-narcotics team to come and investigate. And they arrested the man who was, uh, who, who was in charge of this trade to the United States with the help of the South African police, and he was deported to the United States and stood trial in, in um, New York and was sentenced, I think, to five years. So South Africa is fully aware of the heroin trade that is devastating the youth, especially the, the, the poor African youth in, in the townships and in our big cities in South Africa. But it has done nothing about bringing Mozambique to book about uh, importing heroin in, into, into South Africa. Instead, what it has done, it has sent a contingent of its army to go and fight against what we are told, I haven't seen any evidence, but what we are told are so-called Islamists in one of the provinces of northern Mozambique called Cabo Delgado. So the South, South Africa has sent a contingent uh, there. So that's point number one. On the issue of Zimbabwe, as you know, the ZANU-PF regime, when it, it started to lose the vote uh, in, the, in the election, it turned against the opposition and brutalized the opposition and rigged the elections. But the outcome for South Africa was in the destruction of the economy of Zimbabwe, a huge flood of people uh, ran into South Africa, others, of course, to Zambia and Botswana and so on, and to the United Kingdom, Australia, and other places. So the, the collapse, the destruction of democracy and of the economy in Zimbabwe has had very direct effect on South Africa. But the South African government, instead of supporting the opposition to, so that democracy worked in Zimbabwe, went around in circles uh, negotiating with Robert Mugabe. And, uh, and as you know, Zimbabwe is actually a military regime dressed up in, in drag. Let me put it that way. We have a military regime <laughs> in Zimbabwe. Okay, I have two questions for you, Maletsi. One is, does the ANC have no shame? Do they realize how iconic they are to black people all over the world. I've actually made this point before on this podcast. You know, the ANC has the same status as, you know, the liberation movement, uh, Martin Luther King, and we, we expect a lot from the ANC. We supported the ANC, black people all over the world, and it's very distressing to watch it degenerating into what we are witnessing today. Number two, I first met you when you came to Nigeria, when Obasanjo was president. And I'd love to hear your take on Obasanjo's comments earlier, because I know you know him. Okay. Well, first on, on the ANC, of course, it's a disappointment, not just for many people, not just in Africa, throughout the world. The, the struggle against the party had the support of the Chinese, of the Russians, I think, the Eskimos and <laughs> you know, everybody supported the struggle against the, the against the party. It's a huge dis disappointment that the ANC is degenerating the way it, it, it is doing. But on the other hand, if we we look at the general context of liberation movements in Africa, it is not unique. Uh, other African countries before us achieve their liberation and their independence and their democracy before us. And this democracy was followed by military regimes, by civil wars, by all the things, the disasters we know about in Africa. So in a way, 
uh, we thought many people thought that the ANC was diff was going to be different from other African countries, and I, I'm glad to say this. The, what we are seeing is that we are like other African countries. We are part of Africa. And the elite in, in South Africa, the African elite post-liberation is no different from uh, this in their selfishness from post uh, from elites in other African countries. Well, I so, remember a joke that used to be made many years ago at the height of apartheid, that the difference between Nigeria and South Africa is that in Nigeria, the whites are black. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Obasanji, of course, was, was very close to my brother uh, when Tabon Beck was president. Uh, I was very close to one of my favorite people in Nigeria, who actually I think should have Re, uh, replaced Obasanjo as president was MKO Abiola, uh, who was killed by that cowboy Abacha. Niger, you know, Obasanjo is one of the w very well respected elder statesmen in Africa. He's the only soldier who actually gave up power and, and, and voluntarily agreed to the reinstatement of, uh, of a democratic government. So there's a lot of respect for Abasanjo, not just in South Africa and Nigeria, but in many other parts of Africa. Uh, I don't know if he still does. He used to run a conference in, in Ethiopia, in Lake Tana, on issues of African security. So Abasanjo is very, very concerned ab ab about the, the, the welfare of poor people in, 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 in Africa and in his country. In fact, if, 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 if he is the one who, who explained about the rise of uh, this Muslim group, remind me Boko what Haram. Called. Boko Haram. Boko, Obasanjo explained that Boko, it was the military that repressed what was a, huma, a humanitarian civil society organization that eventually cultivated. It ended up as an armed organization. So, so the, for me, I have a lot of respect for, for Basanjo uh, and, and his opinions. South Africa's sending, what, um, just under 3,000 troops eventually to DRC uh, to help fight armed groups in the east of the country. Um, and as I mentioned at the, at the very start of this show, um, uh, South Africa is putting an immense amount of its diplomatic capital into fighting Israel at the ICJ in The Hague. Um, I'm just wondering why. Why are these foreign policy decisions being made? What's driving them when you've got on virtually on your doorstep, you've got a genocide taking place in parts of Sudan, you've got a civil war that's tearing a country apart, and I don't hear South Africa mentioning a word. Well, the... The, the ANC specifically has, has a very long relationship with the Palestine Liberation Front and with Fatah in particular. So it was no great surprise for me that the ANC, uh, seeing this shocking massacre of Palestinian people, both as it happens, both South Africa and Israel are signatories of the Convention on, on, on uh, Genocide. So one of the somebody had to take action about about Israel's a massacre of the Palestinian civilian population, and in South Africa, the the, the the population, most of the certainly all of the black population is behind uh, the action at the at the ICJ. Of course, we we have a Jewish population which thinks differently. The decision, for example, to send the army to Mozambique and now to the DRC, they are made by the Southern African Development Community. They are not specifically South Africa made. South Africa is a member. We have an architecture in Africa of how to keep peace. And it, the, this architecture involves economic organization, regional economic organizations. In West Africa, it's ECOWAS. In Southern Africa, it's SADC. So SADC 
has both an economic and responsibility as well as a peace and security responsibility. So South Africa has sent its troops to, to, to the DRC at the, as part of its membership to the Southern Africa Development Community, which is part of our African unity infrastructure or architecture of maintaining peace and security on the African continent. It's, it's not a specifically South African decision. Now, in the Sudan, uh, South Africa has been very active in, in, in the Sudan. In fact, the, the man who is high com- South Africa's high commissioner to the United Kingdom, his assignment before then was to deal with the conflicts in, in, in Sudan. So, so South Africa has been active in the, in, in the Sudan conflict uh, for, for quite a, a, a long time. So it's not correct that they are jumping on all the way to the Middle East and ignoring conflicts in, in, in but Africa. But are they not ignoring domestic problems that are pretty acute? And another thing I was going to say to follow up on your earlier response was that in, making, in turning South Africa into a, a failing state, they are proving the white people right. A lot of white people said, you hand this thing over to Africans, it'll go to shit. Sorry, excuse my language. The same way as so many other African countries. No, I, I, don't, I don't think they're proving white people right. They, they're proving that, that African people are just as greedy as <laughs> anyone else. True. And if you give them uncontrolled power, they will steal and they will eat and they will eat, trample on everyone else um, like Israel is doing. And you can't accuse Israel of being African or black. It's trampling on the Palestinians. It's been doing it for 75 years. Uh, so if you have uncontrolled power by an elite, that's what it does. Maletsi, your, your, your piece I was talking about earlier, um, you talk about redemption. What, 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 are the, what are the pluses ahead of us for South Africa? Because as I, I think we're all agreed that, you know, the current situation is untenable. Things have got to change politically, economically, but developmentally. I think uh, 10, 10 million people are without jobs right now. What's, in sort of shorthand, what's the route out of all this, do you think? Well, South Africa really, in a way, is going through cycles that many other countries go through. We, we had a, a, a cycle of slavery where we, where, where we had slaves brought in from Asia and from other parts of Africa, Mozambique, Madagascar, West Africa, and so on. So for 200 years or so, we, we had slavery. Then we had indentured labor where, where, where the British brought people from uh, India to go and work at their sugar estate under atrocious conditions and so on. And then we have a migrant labor system which was developed by the British mining companies to mine diamonds and gold and, and so on. Uh, so these are the, the cycles. And eventually we, we had a democratic system uh, 30 years ago. Now, in the democratic system, what we didn't, we thought, and the whole world thought, that everybody, except a few whites, were united in South Africa to achieve a democratic and equitable South Africa. Actually, what we are now finding out is that the African middle class were always in it for themselves, not they, they cooperated with the Indians, they cooperated with the colors, with the whites, with the working class in order to get rid of apartheid. But once they got rid of apartheid and grabbed hold of power in the state, they turned the state as an engine for the African middle class. And that's what has been set, happening. Now, the rule of the African middle class in South Africa has led to a number of things a continuation of the, especially of the migrant labor system in the mines, which is a very, it generates a lot of poverty in the population. And an enrichment via the state and state jobs of this enormous 
African middle class that has emerged in South Africa. You know, the other day, the, the government published that they have 55,000 public servants who are earning a million rands each a year. 55,000. Now, think of it in your in pounds. Equate it. Don't uh, use the exchange rate because the buying power of a South African rand is probably equivalent to the pound. So a guy earning a million rands is equivalent to a person earning a million pounds, a civil servant in England earning a million pounds. I don't think it happens. In fact, the other day I was talking to, there was a, pro, a project between the South African government and the German government. The project collapsed because the Germans found out that the South African civil servants who they had to finance were paid more than the <laughs> German civil servants. <laughs> so the Germans said, no, 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 we're not going to pay you guys more than we pay ourselves. So this is why I was saying to you, Donald, when you put people in a position to, to be selfish and to have power, to, 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 to indulge their selfishness, whatever their color, they will do it. <laughs> uh, and no, we are through that era in South Africa is very painful for everybody except for the guys who are living large. I mean, I was told the other day about a former uh, civil servant who, who, who lives in the Eastern Cape. Can I um, finally ask you one question, Maletzi, and that is your, your critique of the ANC's 30 years in power has been pretty withering. Uh, it's quite excoriating, and you've particularly been uh, critical of of uh, of South Africa's policy of gentle diplomacy or quiet diplomacy with Zimbabwe, which of course is associated with your brother specifically. I just wondered, what are relations like between you and your bro? I mean, what are family dinners like? Well, well, you know, we, we've had in in my family, we've been in politics, I think, for over 150 years <laughs> and we have a golden rule that we don't interfere in each other's opinions <laughs> so, so i i have no idea i don't interfere with with, with my brother so family dinners they're a they're a, oh, a raucous good family. good natured affair yes they're always very good natured. only my mother occasionally used to query politics <laughs> political decisions <laughs> of the male members of the family. Well, let's see, and Becky, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Now to the bit about donkeys. Did you know that two-thirds of the world's donkeys live in Africa? That's around 33 million. And did you know that they've been increasingly stolen, trafficked and slaughtered for a growing trade in donkey skins, which feed demand in China for a kind of traditional medicine. Well, AU leaders have now stepped in. They've issued a ban on the slaughter of donkeys. And we can hear more about this by speaking to Dr. Solomon Onyango, who's director of the Donkey Sanctuary in Kenya. And he'll tell us why the plight of the humble donkey has reached the dizzying heights of the African leaders at the AU summit. Welcome, Dr. Solomon. Tell us then, why were African Union leaders so concerned about the plight of donkeys? Thank you very much. The way the issue came up is that initially everyone thought that there is potential for, uh, for Africa to trade on donkeys and there's potential for the people, the communities to benefit from it. And also the fa initial assumption was that p there was market for donkey meat in in eastern in the eastern part of the world, specifically China. And so there are governments which licenses the slaughterhouses to allow them to operate. But within a year, everyone realized that no one was really interested in the donkey meat. What was the driving force was the donkey skin. And this who came, we all come to realize by even doing the uh, impromptu inspections at the slaughterhouses where you visit some of these slaughterhouses and you find that most of the donkey carcasses are just left there, rotting. It's only the skin which which have been taken. 
And the other thing which came up also with time is that the donkey skin became more expensive than even the donkey itself. So for example, in in Kenya, you'll find that you can easily get up to 20,000 Kenya shillings to sell the donkey skin, while selling a donkey is just 10,000 shillings. So you see, this pattern became kind of similar to what we have been seeing in, with our elephants, where the task seems to have been the driving force, not, not meat. Most of the donkeys are working donkeys, being used by most rural communities for livelihood and also for youth as employment. But because most people do not want to sell their donkeys, so they, they started go, doing very, very shady deals, whereby the donkeys were being stolen, sl slaughtered, only the skin taken. I, I, one of the case example is there used to be in, in one of the towns in Kenya, Naivasha, we, we used to have a farmer who was doing donkey dairy farming and he was doing a very lucrative, he was selling the donkey milk and the donkey milk is used as a medicinal in some parts of Kenya, around 20 of donkeys. One day he woke up, found that all the donkeys had been stolen. When they looked around, they found the donkeys were in a near bush, only the skin taken. The rest of the carcass were left. And this is what now prompted most of the governments to start looking into this trade. And when they looked into it, it's when they found that, that there was a challenge here, that this, at this rate, we are going to clear all the donkeys in Africa. And what is the value of the, the donkey to rural communities in Kenya, for instance? There's many places in the rural communities where watering points are like four or five kilometers away from home states. So the donkey is the only so it's the only means they can use to go and fetch water and come back. If they don't have the donkey, then that means that the wife or, or, or the girls will have to go and fetch water. So you find that in such scenarios, either the, the girls don't go to school because they have to spend the whole day looking for water, or the, the, the people just suffer getting water. And also you find that in most of the peri-urban areas in Kenya, the youth are using the donkeys as, as a source of livelihood by transporting goods back and forth. The donkeys still playing a major role in transportation of agricultural products from the farms because the roads are very hilly, so it's very difficult for mechanized transport to go. So the donkeys is very, very crucial for most livelihood currently in most rural homes. Solomon, I wish there was a Chinese person here so I could ask them what they actually gain from the skins. Do you know what they need it for? Yes, yeah. Now, what, what is happening is that the donkey, the donkey skin is a bit more developed than most of other animals, and it's developed in terms of production of a, a, a compound called collagen. Uh, and collagen. they have been using this, yes, they have been using this collagen to manufacture a product, a beauty product called a jow. And this beauty product seems to have gained a lot of popularity in China. And, you know, and from a donkey skin, the collagen that you can get is very little. So to get adequate supplies, you really need a lot of skins. If the donkeys were being slaughtered for meat, purely for meat, then there wouldn't have been this problem. But because you are just after the skin, then you just get all these problems. I'll just take an example of an animal that produces quickly, like chicken. Chicken produces very quickly. But if we decide that we are not interested in the meat from chicken, we just want the beak because that is like ivory. You'll find that we'll slaughter all the chicken in one day in the world. Why can't they use collagen sources like everybody else, i.e. marine? <laughs> uh, it, 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 there's an argument that the collagen from the donkey make a better quality product. That is the kind of argument that has been floated. Um, and what's, what's happened to all the donkeys that would have been in China? China was one of the one of the countries with the highest population of donkeys in the world, almost 11 million donkeys. But when the Ajao market started picking, picking up, what they have seen is that their donkey population has gone down to almost just 4 million. And then, that, so what they tried to do is they tried breeding. They started trying breeding farms, but those did not work because mass breeding of donkeys don't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because donkeys by nature were animals which were adapted for arid and semi-arid areas. So they are not used to living in large numbers because in dry lands, you have to live very few because food is scarcity. So when they are put too many together, they automatically start de developing depression and distress. Their breeding goes down and generally they don't perform well in breeding, as opposed to when they're just left free range, like the way they are naturally supposed to be. And so now the uh, African Union has banned the slaughter of donkeys for their skins. Is that going to be easy to implement? Is that going to be easy to put in place around Africa 
and prevent these uh, donkeys being nabbed for their skins? Of course, because different countries generally in Africa have different ways they approach things or prioritize things. So we definitely expect that it will be a slow process in implementation. The only advantage we have now currently is that legally there is no country legally which can say they're trading on donkey skins. So curbing that trade will can, it can be a bit easier because previously the challenge has been that Kenya has banned a lot of donkeys, but find maybe a, a neighboring country there has not banned. So people are smuggling donkey skins into that neighboring country and then exporting them legally. Now that it's a continental thing, it's easy to police because any country that is exporting donkey skin will have to be looked into as to why they're doing it when it's, uh, they have agreed not to do it. Um, well, this this AU uh, directive now deals with the supply side, but what about the demand side? I mean, if the demand is still there in China, uh, you've still got a massive problem, right? Yes, yeah, de de definitely. We know that uh, one thing we'll have to be proactive about is the danger that wildlife trade has been experiencing. Where because the legal trade it has been stopped, because there's still demand, people will start looking for extra legal ways to keep on trading or to keep on the supply. So that that we expect is something that will be a result of this this ban. And 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 which means the, the vigilance will be will be very keen. One advantage we have is because the uh, US seems to have been also a, a large market for Ajao, but just the other day we saw that they floated in the US Congress a bill to ban sale of any form of Ajao products in US as a way to protect African donkeys. So we hope if the uh, US can pass that, it can be a multiply effect globally. And Patrick, um, what are your thoughts about collagen, marine produced, donkey produced or otherwise? I think I'm, I'm going to give up collagen for Lent, actually, uh, <laughs> as my contribution to donkey welfare. Um, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you, Solomon, is the diplomatic level of, of, of this. Um, if China is the major market for these uh, stolen donkeys, um, has there been any diplomatic response from Beijing after the African Union passed this this export ban? Because it's a you know it's a bit like the rhino horn thing. Uh, elderly men around the world are searching for rhino horn for the obvious reasons, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, but China was a big big market for it, uh, and eventually they kind of acquiesced a bit. I mean, have you heard anything official response? Of, from China on this? Oh, okay. Uh, up to now, we have not had any official response from, from China. There is no country in Africa which has direct import exportation permit to move animal products to China. Most of these products go through other countries. So when they arrive in China, they don't look like they've come from Africa. They always look like they've come from one of those other countries. And uh, I think that that is one of the reasons that this trade, China has never been really proactive in responding to this trade. But we, we hope that if we get full support of the US, we can use that as a leverage to see if we can influence China also to do something about HR. But presumably because of the volume of the trade, there are criminal syndicates making loads of money out of that. Do you think yes. we're now going to see some determined action by police authorities across Africa sort of to track these uh, donkey smugglers? Of course we are. Do you see any sign of that? Yes, definitely. Definitely we're going to see a lot of actions, action to try and stop. And also because the other things, most of these animal welfare organizations are very proactive. And, they have, uh, and also most of the communities in Africa were not, were, were not very happy about the trade. So expect a lot of proactiveness in trying to police what is happening and trying to stop it. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Solomon Onyango. Thank you so much. Never say you don't learn anything here at the Africa Here and Now podcast, because I think we've all learned a bit today, haven't we? Certainly about donkey skins and collagen. Thank you. Well, that's all for this edition. We are an independent podcast. We haven't got any ads or any sponsorship. So if you like what we're doing, please consider making a donation or subscribing so we can continue the conversations. Go to www.africaheroenow.com. There you can make a donation. You can also find out 
about us, more about us, and you can listen to all of our episodes. We recorded this on Tuesday, the 20th of February. Our producer is Anne Busby. Tyler Hilton helps us. Original music is by Enric Adam. Chris at the podcast company puts it all together. So thanks to our guests, former president of Bass & Joe, Morletzi and Becky, and Dr. Solomon and Yango. From Donu, Patrick and me, thank you 